Hi everyone. So sticking with the emulator theme that I'm on at the moment, I thought I'd have a go at emulating the ZX Spectrum. This was the first machine I ever owned. I got it as a Christmas gift. I think it was 82 or 83, 16K model. And it was by far the best Christmas gift I've ever received. And it was the machine to have back in the day. It was cheap and pretty much everyone had it. There was tons and tons of games available for them. This has, you know, a lot of meaning for me. So emulating it and writing an emulator for it would be would be pretty cool. So for this, I'm not going to be emulating the CPU. Um, well, I'm going to be emulating the CPU, but I'm not going to be writing that from scratch. I don't want this to be four episodes long again. I could have built on the 8080 code that I already have because, you know, it's it's pretty much the same. It's just some extras. But I thought, nah, we'll, we'll just go with a with an existing solution, a Z80 emulator. But the rest of it should be challenging enough to get it working. Now, the Spectrum itself isn't a particularly complex machine. It's, it's just a Z80 processor, a bit of RAM, and a ULA chip, which handles the input-output and the drawing of the screen. So all we're really doing by emulating this machine is emulating the ULA. So, we'll see how we go. Let's get on with it. Here's Visual Studio. I've already started a new project. So let's go ahead and rename Form 1. So I usually do to UI. And we'll just give this a better title. So, YouTube Spectrum. We're going to need a control to put on here which is going to be the screen of the spectrum. So let's just take a look at what we're going to need here. I've got the information on this web page here. And it looks like we've got 64 lines of basically border or vertical refresh, 192 lines of the actual display with a border either side, and then another 56 lines of border. So in total, that's 64 plus 192 plus 56 gives us 312 and that's almost half the number of pal because multiply that by 2 we get 624 and pal has 625 lines so that kind of makes sense so our vertical size is 312 and if we want to maintain a 4 by 3 aspect ratio here divide that by 3 multiply it by 4 we get 416 so our control needs to be 416 by 312 but that's going to be a little small I think so we'll use a picture box for this and the reason I'm using a picture box is because you can update the image in a picture box and it won't flicker if you try and do it with something like a panel and use the background image of a panel when you update it it kind of flickers so and a picture box doesn't do that so if we go, what do we say, 416 by 312, see that's kind of small. So let's double that. Okay, that's a bit better. But we'll allow this to be resized anyway. So let's just get that top right, left and bottom so that we can resize the window to whatever we want. Also, we need to set the background image mode of this window. So background image layout will set to zoom so that the image that's drawn inside that picture box will always be the right uh, size or the right aspect ratio. Okay, so now we should be able to, yeah, and it will increase the size of the picture box as you see there. But that's what we're going to work with for now. We're going to need to be able to receive key press events in this, obviously, because we need to type but a picture box isn't a focusable control, so it can't actually receive key press events. Now, one way of getting around that is in the actual form to, if I can find it here, is to enable this control key preview. And that will allow us to receive keyboard events on pretty much everything. But I might want to add controls and things to this in the future, so I, I, that might interfere. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a bit of a hack to convert the picture box into a focusable control 
the proper way of doing this is kind of involved. So I'm going to do it the quick and dirty way. So if I view code here, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a checkbox. And now I'm going to set the size of that checkbox to basically no size at all. So size.empty. And then I'm going to add that checkbox to the control space of the picture box. So I actually need to name that, won't I? So let's call this PB screen. Okay. So to PB screen controls, yep, we're going to add our checkbox. Now, of course, checkbox is a focusable control. It can receive uh, key press events. So by adding it to the control space of the picture box, we effectively turn the picture box into a focusable control. So if we attach the click event of the picture box, so PB screen dot click. So if the picture box is clicked, we can transfer control or transfer focus to the invisible checkbox. PB screen dot controls and we'll take the first control because that's going to be the only one in there and we'll focus to it and that will basically convert the picture box into a focusable control that can receive key press events so all we need to do now is add the events for the key press so that's going to be cb uh, key key down and key up We'll deal with those in a minute. We don't need to worry about them just yet. So, okay, we've got the basics set up there for the screen and keyboard. But, of course, an important part here is we need to emulate a Z80. Now, I'm not going to write the Z80 emulator from scratch like I did with the 8800, because I don't want this to be four episodes long again. So I'm going to use an existing one. So let's have a look. We've got, if we go into our package manager here... We got this one up here by Conamiman. Conamiman. I don't know how to pronounce that. So, but we'll add that one. That one's the most popular. So we'll use that. Okay. So the Z8 is installed. Now we're going to create a class to deal with all the um, the stuff with the spectrum. So let's create a new class. We'll call this Core. It's going to be the core of the spectrum. And I'm going to make it a partial class because I'm going to split this. It's going to be kind of big and I don't really want to get into getting class happy. So I'm just going to use the one class and then split it up as needed just to keep the code tidy. Right, so I found this GitHub page, which is basically the GitHub for that package that we just installed for the, the processor. And I've been reading through this to try and decide on the strategy for how we're going to do this. Now, this thing does support uh, clock speeds and it, it does the delays itself, but I'm not actually going to do that. The, the goal of this video is to create a working spectrum emulator, you know, nothing fancy, just something that works, and load in the game Manic Miner from cassette. So to do that, I'm going to need to be also using an audio package so that I can sample audio and also create audio. What I'm going to use for that, so I'm going to go to my package manager again, I'm going to use N audio. I've used this before so I'm kind of familiar with it and it is very popular as you can see. We'll install that as well. So we're going to get our core um, class here. We're going to make that implement Wavestream and this is part of N audio. I need to include it. And then also we need to implement the interfaces, but I'm not going to implement them in this. So I'm going to create a new item. Okay. And this is going to be audio out and we're going to deal with all the audio stuff in here. Let's go back to core and we'll implement those interfaces and we'll take these out and we'll shove them in here. I'm going to use an 8-bit stream. There's nothing, no real reason to use anything more than that. So what do we need here? Okay, sample rate. I think what we'll do is we'll, we want this to be as high as possible. So I'm going to try 96,000. 
Now I've eight bits and one channel. But what I'm going to this is basically going to be the base frequency of our um, of our emulator, and I'll explain why in a minute. So we'll create base frequency, which is going to be ninety six thousand. That will allow us to e easily change it, and we'll change this to base frequency. In the wave, and I'm probably going to use the wave input, the audio input rather than the output. As that task runs, as it, it fetches audio from the input source, the microphone or whatever, it runs an event called data available. Yeah, and it, it's constantly calling that all the time as it fetches data from the input. So what we can do is we can utilize that. We can utilize that that call to that function to execute Z80 instructions. That way we don't need to worry about pausing and sleeping the thread because that will be handled for us by the, the audio system, the underlying audio system. So all we need to do is just make sure we execute enough clock cycles within that loop to keep the speed right. So let's get a few variables sorted. So we've got the base frequency, which is 96,000. We're also going to need, I'm just going to put this on a new line, the clock frequency, three and a half megahertz. Let's create a constructor for this. So public core. So from this, we can work out the amount of clock cycles, what's called T states, that we need to execute for every single sample of our base frequency because basically this means 96,000 samples per second. So we we just divide one into the other, but this isn't always going to divide exactly, right? If we use something like 70,000, it would, but um, we never know what we're going to do here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a float. So private read only float, and we'll call this speed, okay, is going to be our clock frequency divided by our base frequency and we'll make these floats and this will represent then like I said the amount of uh, clock cycles we need to execute for every sample. While we're executing the, the Z80 instructions we're also going to need to be drawing the screen right and the screen is drawn line by line on the original hardware so we may as well do the same thing. Obviously the screen is being drawn all the time so what we need to do is figure out how many clock cycles we need to execute before we need to draw another line. And that's relatively simple. We know that the, we'll call this line frequency. So the line frequency is going to be the amount of lines on the screen divided by our clock frequency. But in fact, what I think I'll do is I'll actually divide it by the base frequency instead to give us the amount of samples we need to process before we draw a line. That's going to be floats, actually, let's, so the amount of lines on the screen is 312 multiplied by 50, because there's 50 frames per second, yeah? And then that's going to be divided by our base frequency, okay? And that will give us the amount of samples we need to process before we draw a new line. Now, of course, this value is going to be less than one. So in the loop, what we'll do is we'll just keep adding a counter until this value gets above one. We'll draw a line. We take one away from the counter and we keep going that way. The the float part of this will actually work. It will it will cause an adjustment every now and again of one less or one more to keep everything in sync. And the same with speed. Now, because this class is going to have to be drawing onto the screen basically it's going to need a reference to whatever we're drawing on so i'm going to pass the picture box element from form into this picture box and we'll need to include the namespace so also we're going to need to put a image into that that we're going to be drawing on so let's create a bitmap and we'll just call this screen so our screen is going to be a new bitmap and that's going to be uh, what did we say 416 by 312 and we're also going to make this an indexed color bitmap and I'm going to use 8 bit plane I'm going to use an 8 bit um, index so I could use a 4 bit uh, index but that means I'll have to be messing around with nibbles when I'm drawing the screen 
So I'm going to use a 8-bit plane. That way, one pixel equals one byte, and it just makes it a lot easier to deal with. So we need pixel formats and 8-bit planes indexed. And then we'll add that screen to the picture box. So pb screen dot background image is equal to screen. And before we do that, let's set up the palette. So we need to get uh, the color palette. So color palette pal is equal to screen palette. Okay, here we go. These are the color palettes. We've got D7 and FF. Okay. Bright is FF and non-bright is D7. So let's just make a couple of ints for that. Bright FF and we'll say norm for normal is equal to D7. So what we got, we've got uh, zero is black. Okay, well, it's easy enough. So palette dot entries zero equals color from ARGB zero zero zero. Now one, is it blue? Yeah, blue. So that's uh, norm in the blue area. And what I think I'll do is I'll arrange the palettes. For the, so the first eight will be the normal colors and then the next eight after that will be the bright colors. So there we go, there's our palette. So for any particular pixel, we just need to select whichever color index it is and then add that as a single byte. Should be easy. Now we'll just drop that palette back into the bitmap. So screen palette is equal to pal and that should set all of that up. Let's set up the processor. So private read only uh, Z80. This is a CPU equals new Z80 processor. So as I mentioned, we're going to deal with the CPU execution during the audio capture because we're going to utilize the timing on that. So let's create another file. So new item and this is audio in and uh, CPU. So it's basically dual purpose. So we need a wave in device. So private read only wave in. Uh, we'll call this sampler. Sampler equals new wave in. Okay, so we need to set the wave format and we need to attach an event which will be called when it's receiving data. So that's sampler dot data available and add that event. And this will take out of here and shove it in here. So this is going to deal with audio capture, but for now, we're, we're just going to ignore that because we're just going to use this as the processor execution loop. So let's just go through the amount of samples that this has collected. So for int i equals zero, i is less than e dot bytes recorded, i plus plus. So for every byte we've recorded, that's basically a sample and there's going to be 96,000 of those every second. So we need to execute for every sample uh, our speed, where we have speed here, yet yeah, this amount of clock cycles. CPU dot execute next instruction. There we go. Now this is going to return the amount of T states or clock cycles or whatever you want to call them that it took to execute that instruction. So we need to record that. So what we're going to do is we're going to add it to a counter and then as soon as that counter gets above our speed we'll we'll carry on. Uh, I think we'll need to use a float. Last t state uh, count last t count. Okay. Let's set that up as zero to begin with. Alright and we'll set a t count which is going to be equal to the last t count and then we'll add the amount of T states it took to execute that instruction and we'll do this while our T count is less than our speed so it will execute enough instructions here until we get to our speed which is the amount of clock cycles that we need to execute for every sample now this is not always going to be exact so we're going to have some left over and that's what the last T count is for 
So we'll set last t count is equal to our current count minus our speed. If this sort of overshot a little bit, it will carry that over into this value and it will start from that point on here. And that will use the floating point properly. So we can actually set a speed which isn't an integer and it will work in that loop. Now, of course, we also need to draw lines on the screen. So we can use similar logic to this. So we've got t count there and we'll use last line as well. So with last line, we'll add our line frequency. And line frequency is less than one. So we need to check if last line is now greater than one. If last line is greater than or equal to one, then we need to draw a line. So we'll just prototype that for now, draw a line. And then after we've drawn the line, we basically take one away from last line. And that will deal with the floating point again with the lines. And in fact, we need to send over the amount of lines, you know, which line it's actually drawing. So we'll, we'll call this line count. Okay, so we're drawing line, line count plus plus, int line number. Also, when we get to the end of the screen, obviously, we've got to come back to the top. So if it, after we've drawn that line there, after line count is increased, if line count is 312, right, then we've come to the end of the screen. We set line count back to zero. And we also need to fire the spectrum's interrupt at this point. So fire interrupt. And we'll just prototype that. So I think that's pretty much it for the execution. And so we don't really need to worry about the interrupts for now. We're only going to need those when we start dealing with the keyboard. So we can just leave that prototype. But draw line, we do need to sort out. So the way we're going to deal with the screen we're going to use a, a bitmap buffer. So we'll create screen data. And what we're going to do, we're going to take that byte array and we're going to shove it into the bitmap every frame. So that's going to be a new byte. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put 312 multiplied by 416. So it's obvious what that is. OK, so that's our screen data. And what we'll do is we'll draw into the screen data itself. We won't draw directly onto the bitmap. That will just be copied in one chunk. We'll marshal that into there. Now, when we're dealing with the, the screen, we're also going to have a border color, right? So border isn't dealt with in memory. It actually exists in port space. And you, you set that with an output call. But we'll need a border color is equal to 7. I won't make that read only because it needs to change. It will set it to the default value 7, which is white. If our line number is less than, I believe it's 64, or our line number is greater than, well, that's going to be 64 plus 192, which I think is 256, or line number is greater than or equal to 256, then this is top and bottom border. So we're going to need to just fill in that particular line. But of course, we've got to know where that's the offset that's going to be into the byte array. So that's going to be, remember, there's 416 uh, pixels across. So our line, we'll call this line start, is going to be our line number multiplied by 416. And in actual fact, we're going to forget the first eight bytes. So if line number is less than eight, we're just not going to bother doing anything to simulate the vertical refresh lines at the top. Okay, so that would give us 56, 56 uh, borders at the top, 56 on the bottom. So we need to fill that particular line with the border color. So let's just create a, a static method we can use for that. So private fill and we're filling an array so that's byte array and we're filling it with a value so that's what we're filling it with and this is where we're starting so start and length and of the fill is going to be our start plus our length 
So we can say while start is less than end array start plus plus is equal to with. Okay, that should fill in a particular range of an array. So here we can do fill and we're filling screen data. Okay, we're filling it with the border color. Uh, we're starting at line start and the length is 416. We'll make border color a byte then. So that deals with our top and bottom border. And that's all we really need to do now. So we can just return. Multiple exit points. <laughs> Sue me. So now we've got to deal with the actual image data. So to start off with, we're going to still have a border left and right. So we can fill those in now. Fill screen data. And again, we're filling that with the border color and line start. But this time we're only going so far across. So we've got 416 across. And we need to take away 256 from that and divide it by 2 gives us 80. Okay, so that's the left border. Now the right border, again that's 80, but it's going to start so far in. So it's going to be 80 plus 256, which is 336. So line start plus 336. So now we're drawing the actual data that's got to go in the main area of the screen. So we may as well update line start yeah, because that's going to be the start of where the, the main image data is going to be. And the actual line we're drawing is going to be 64 less than what's come in through here. Okay, so getting rid of the border. So that's uh, minus equals 64. Now we have to deal with the strange way that the spectrum arranges its screen data. And it does this just to, to make it faster for the ULA to draw it. It sort of blocks it in particular areas. But uh, yeah, it can be sort of tricky. So we've got this information in here somewhere. Yeah, here we go. This is the way the bits are arranged. So we need to work out the address in RAM, which corresponds to our particular line. Line address. Okay, so line address is going to be equal to so these are the bits for the way they're sort of jumbled around. So this basically is our line number going from Y0 to Y7. Now bits 0, 1 and 2 of that go 8 bits to the left. So th these bits would normally be here in 0, 1 and 2 and they get shifted 8. So 3 bits is a mask of 7. So we've got line number and 7 to get those 3 bits. And we need to shift that left 8 bits. Okay, so the next three, which are Y3 to Y5, which would normally be here in 3 to 5, go into 5 to 7. So they need to shift left by 2 bits. So we need a mask for that, which is going to be 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. E0. Okay, so we're going to all that with, and this is E0, and this is shifted left 2 bits. And then the last two, Y6 and Y7, which would normally go here. So that's one, two, three, four, five bits left. And that's 11 and 12. So those two bits are normally at six and seven. So they go one, two, three, yeah, five. So, no, I've done this wrong. No, we need the mask on three, four, five. Sorry about that. Bits five, four, three, two, one, zero. That's hex 38. Glad I spotted that. So hex 38. And then our last one are bits uh, 6 and 7, which usually go here, which is shifted left. So 6 and 7 is C0. Okay. So this is C0, shifted left 5. And we also need to set this bit here, bit 14, which is 4000 hex. So or 4000. That should give us the address in RAM of that particular line. Now that's not the only thing we're going to need because we're also going to need the attribute. So the attributes start at address 5800. Okay, that's immediately after the bitmap data. So, and these are linear, they just go from zero upwards. So we need to work out which attribute we're talking about. 
So since the attributes are arranged in eight by eight blocks, they're basically characters, right? So we need to work out what character Y, which character along the vertical, that particular line is within. So to do that, let's call that uh, char Y. So char Y is equal to, so that's gonna be our line number divided by eight. And because that's an int, it will round it down. But this is the address of the attribute block, right? So we need to add, we need to multiply that by 32 because there's 32, col there's 32 characters in a line. And then we need to add the offset to the start of the attribute block, which was 5,800. And that will give us the address of the first attribute on that line. Now, what we could do here is instead of dividing by eight, we can shift that right by three bits and then shift this left by five bits. That should be done by the compiler, I think, but I'll just make sure it's more efficient, basically. All right, we're going to need to set up some RAM, aren't we? Forgot about that. Okay, so private byte. Connect this read only. RAM is equal to new byte six five five three six. Okay, there's our RAM. All right, so there's each line has thirty two uh, bytes of bitmap data. So for int char, we'll call this char x is equal to naught. Char x is less than thirty two. So we're going to need to get the attribute at that particular byte's address. So we'll say byte attribute is equal to, and that's going to be in RAM, and it's going to be char y plus char x. And that will give us our attribute for that particular byte. So let's work out our ink and paper color. So we've got some information on that. Yeah, here we go. So ink is bits 0 to 2. So int ink is, that's going to be our attribute and seven. Our paper color, uh, that's bits three to five. Yeah, hex 38. So that's going to be attribute and zero x 38, shifted right by three bits. And that'll give us our paper color. Okay, we also need to deal with the brightness for ink and paper which is bit number six, so 40. So if at and zero x 40, okay, if that's not equal to zero, then the bright bit is set. So we will add eight to ink and eight to paper to get it into the bright area of the palette. Right, we also have a flashing attribute. That's bit seven. Okay, so flash is gonna be equal to attribute and 0x80 is not equal to zero. So if the flash is set, but remember flash intermittently changes. So um, to invert ink and paper, we'll probably need some kind of timer. Okay, we'll deal with that in a minute. But just for now, I'm gonna set up private ball flash invert. We'll set that to false for now. And we'll set up a timer just to to switch that backwards and forwards uh, every half second. Basically, if the flash attribute is set and we're in a flash invert cycle, then we need to swap ink and paper. Actually, what we'll do is we'll set all do flash is equal to that. So now we need to actually draw the, the line data into the screen data. So we need to scan each bit of the byte. Okay, so we'll get that. So byte, byte is equal to uh, RAM uh, line address plus plus. Okay, and now we need to go through each bit. But it's in reverse order. Okay, so we're putting in the bytes from left to right, but the bits in the byte are from right to left. So we need to scan the byte in reverse order. So if we can do that for int bit, and we'll start at the most significant bit, which is bit seven, which is one to eight, is greater than zero. And then we'll roll the bit right, or shift the bit right by one. So now we just need to put in the relevant value, either ink or paper, depending on whether that bit is set. So if uh, byte 
and bit is not equal to zero. But well, actually, what we'll do is screen data, and this is going to be line start plus plus is equal to. Now we can do the decision. So this is going to be uh, bit and byte is not equal to zero. Uh, so if it's one, it's the ink color or it's the paper color. But we need to be able to deal with flashing. So if do flash, then we need to do that in the other way. Otherwise, we do it the normal way. So in this case, paper and ink will be inverted. So yes, I think I'm going to have to set up an init. So private void init audio in. We'll put this in core. All right. And we need to put the spectrum ROM into the into the memory area. I've got that here. So I'm going to put that into the project folder. So this is my project folder. So we'll go into here, bin, and into the debug, and we'll shove 48k ROM in there. So we need to chuck that into the memory. So array, copy, and the source array is going to be file dot read all bytes 48k ROM. Destination array is RAM and length is 16k. Okay, so that's dumping the ROM into memory. Uh, now we can start the sampler. So sample sampler start recording and that will start our system playing so we need to actually display the screen obviously we can do this in this fire interrupt routine and this is what's going to display the image so first of all let's create a clock because this is going to be done in another thread it has to be done in the ui thread so we're going to clone the display data so we'll say byte clone equals screen data okay screen data dot clone and i think you have to cast that yeah you do and we're going to have to invoke on the on the picture box so first of all let's make sure it hasn't been disposed so if pb screen okay so if it's not disposed then we need to invoke on it so pb screen invoke i'm going to do this very very dirtily so excuse me for that so we basically need to marshal the screen data to the to the image in the picture box so to do that we need to lock the the image this is going to be screen lock bits rectangle okay so new in actual fact uh let's just make that static because it's always going to be the same size so rectangle screen rect equals new rectangle it's going to be zero zero two four one six by three one two so we're locking bits here so that's going to be screen rectangle and the next one is the image lock mode image lock mode dot write only and pixel format it's going to be the same so that's eight bit planes indexed okay this returns a object once it bitmap data bitmap data bmd is equal to that now we can copy our screen data which is our clone into this bitmap we want to marshal dot copy and the source is going to be our clone start index is zero destination well that's in our bitmap data so that's bmd dot scan zero which gives us the pointer to the beginning of that and the length well, that's just going to be clone.length. And that will copy our screen data into that image. Then we need to unlock screen unlock bits BMD. And then we can uh, refresh the control. Have we got everything here? I feel like I haven't done enough here. I mean, it's by no means complete, but I'm trying to get to a point where we can at least see the spectrum start up. Okay, let's give it a go. See what happens. Okay, well, nothing happened in there. Right, so I'm not. I need to tell the Z80 where its RAM is, obviously. So to do that, I need to make core implement iMemory implement interface. So size, okay, that's 65536. And this is what grabs our RAM. So get is going to be RAM address and set. It's going to be RAM address 
equals value. Okay, and we also need to set up, so CPU memory is equal to this. Then that will make the CPU use our RAM rather than its own inbuilt RAM. Let's give that a go, see what happens. Nope. Okay, we've got no action. Okay, might be an idea if we actually created an instance of core, right? <laughs> and we'll create that instance in a shown event. Shown core equals new core. And we need to pass in the screen. Okay, audio in. And I think what we'll do here is we'll start this in its own task rather than uh, in there. Third try, Let's see what happens. Oh my god. Well. That looks like it's working to me. And there's the top of the screen, you can see the eight pixels. Okay. Third time lucky. So I'm going to get a coffee now. I think I deserve one. Right. I'll be back shortly.